Okay, thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'm not going to be able to cover everything. You can go to CT as Us, see a lot of interesting cases. There's more lectures and quizzes and stuff like that. But if you look at cystic pancreatic lesions, I think one of the biggest challenges we have in practice really is cystic lesions and how to manage them. It's interesting if you look at AI, and I know in India and the US, AI is very big and will become bigger and bigger in medicine. One of the things we are working on is using AI for trying to differentiate the various cystic pancreatic lesions because they're very challenging. The question always comes down to management. Do you watch the lesion or do you take it out? And obviously in pancreas, removing lesions means a Whipple's procedure or distal pancreatectomy, which typically means high morbidity and mortality, even in the best of hands. So you think about incidental pancreatic lesions, the better the scanners get, the more incidental lesions you have. Right now on CT, probably over age 40, 5% of patients or more have small cystic lesions. The challenge is often on a size basis, what do you do with these? Do you need to evaluate all of them or is there a specific size? And we'll go through a number of different lesions. So the first thing, of course, we know history is important. Not to forget that pseudocysts are not uncommon particularly younger population patients with history of pancreatitis, the likely diagnosis is going to be pseudocysts. But we know the range of appearances, obviously with a good history, with inflammation of the pancreatic gland, it's a very easy diagnosis. Most pseudocysts will resolve spontaneously over time, but not all of them. And so it would not be uncommon for pseudocysts to present as a clinical problem, particularly if the history of pancreatitis is not known. Pseudocysts typically occur in common locations, peripancreatic areas like lesser sac, pararenal space. Those are the easy ones. The ones that become more challenging is a case like this, where there wasn't a clear history of pancreatitis, patient had vague abdominal pain, and you're sitting with a three centimeter cystic lesion in the head of the pancreas. This could be an IPMN, it's at three centimeters, what do you do with this lesion? It, eventually the patient, because of the abdominal symptoms, had EUS, and this was simply a pseudocyst. If you look hard, there's a faint calcification here, but the history just wasn't pancreatitis. The patient, in fact, denied a history, but this was simply a pseudocyst. So pseudocysts are always something to keep in your mind. And again, clinical history becomes very important. The most common lesion we typically see in practice are IPMNs, intraductal papillary mucinous neoplasms. The problem with IPMNs, they're very common. They can either be side branch or main duct IPMNs or mixed type. The main duct type being where the pancreatic duct is dilated, uh, it used to be felt that anything above a centimeter was suggestive of a main duct IPMN and would require surgery because of a high degree of malignancy. That's still the case, but now anything above seven or eight millimeters is where people are worried. The problem with IPMNs is they are, when you think about it, a pre-malignant condition. But in reality, less than 3% of patients with an IPMN during their lifetime will ever develop a malignancy, which means that 97% of all lesions, in fact, over 97% can be left alone. And that's really the challenge. How do we figure out which ones need to be taken care of and resected versus which ones need to be left alone? There's a <clears throat> There's a lot of work going on in that area now. I won't have time to go into it. A lot of it revolves around looking at the fluid in cysts. You can predict which patients are going to have a higher chance of malignancy, and you would follow them carefully, and which patients have no chance of malignancy, and you could potentially not follow them at all. When you look at the literature, lots of things have been written from the Tanaka criteria forward. Uh, some of the things that predict malignancy, lesion size over 3CM. Remember, there was a time when any lesion 3CM or better was automatically resected. We talk about growth over two millimeters a year. 
the presence of mural nodules or thick septations are always concerning. Whenever I see those in a lesion, I'm worried the patient has malignancy and invariably the patient will get EUS and almost invariably the patient will get surgery. And of course, we always worry about IPMNs, even if they don't look very aggressive, if patients have clinical symptoms, that becomes very important. Simple IPMN, nicely shown here, one centimeter. Basically, these days, we'll simply follow that lesion. Of course, one of the challenges with sampling IPMNs is that although the prior case showed a single lesion, in many of the cases, there are multiple lesions. So here we have a lesion in the uncinate. We have a lesion in the body of the pancreas. What do you do with these? Do you sample both of them? If you thought about resecting, you would need to do a total pancreatectomy. Many patients have multiple IPMNs, and so the only quote-unquote cure or potential cure is a total pancreatectomy. Total pancreatectomies are nightmares because forgetting the complications from surgery itself, patients become diabetic, often brittle diabetic. Patients have all sorts of complications, and patients' lifetime survival decreases with a total pancreatectomy. So most surgeons really will avoid doing a total pancreatectomy as much as they can. And these two lesions, again, invariably at the end of the day, they were sampled and there was no suspicion of those lesions. This lesion, on the other hand, you look at it, it's over 3 cm. There's some thickening in the wall. There are septations. Um, it's hard to leave this lesion alone. Patient was having abdominal pain. This is the lesion you would worry could this patient have a high-grade dysplasia or not? Here's a few more images. This patient went to surgery, had a Whipple's procedure, and it was a low-grade dysplasia. So in some sense, you cure the patient, but patients with low-grade dysplasia typically do not need to have surgery. But at this point, there's no real good way of being certain, short of surgery, that indeed is the case. So in terms of management of patients with IPMNs, Follow-up CT, EUS, and surgery are really the three modes of management. Ideally, we'd like to minimize the number of patients going to surgery, particularly patients who don't need surgery. If you look at most articles published, the majority of patients who end up with surgery for cystic pancreatic lesions are operated on for lesions of low malignant potential, which basically means they don't need surgery. And that's an area where we need to do much better. Now, there's been lots of articles, and I'll just briefly take you through one article. This is the ACR committee's paper on incidental findings. And one of them, of course, is cystic pancreatic lesions. And it was done by a group of people, very talented, including Alec Megabo. If you look at this most recent revision, they made it complicated, trying not to, but they divided the lesions into categories, basically five categories, four of them based on the size of the cyst, under 1.5, 1 1.5 to 2.5, uh, 2.5 or greater, and a patient over 80 years old. And they tried to use the size as a way of managing patients. And one of the issues was, when you read the article, they recommended a nine to 10 year follow-up for patients. Now, did they stop at 10 years? They actually said, well, we really can't say that now. We'll worry about that about nine or 10 years from now. You can argue patients who are above 80 who aren't surgical candidates. Those would be the patients who probably should not be followed. But again, a 10 year follow-up, think of that, a CT or an MR every single year. A, the expense of that, and B, the stress on the patient themselves. Now, if you look at the article, and I'm not going to go through it, it had these flow charts, how you look at the lesion based on size, based on presentation, and it gave a whole range of follow-ups. One of the things I always like to say is when you have a lot of charts and each of the charts has many different pathways. It basically means you're not comfortable with what you're doing. It means you're uncertain. And that's literally what, what Dr. Megabo said. Alex said that, you know, we've learned a lot since the prior paper, which was 2010, but conclusions remain controversial. 
uh, our knowledge base is poor in, or inconclusive, and it's not an answer that we really have at this point. So their presumptions, he had five main points, as I mentioned. Um, all cysts should be considered mucinous when they're incidental. Again, this follow-up becomes one of the real challenges. We, like many of you, do follow-up patients with cystic pancreatic lesions. Often the ones that get very strict follow-up have higher histories, a family history of potential malignancy, but it is very challenging. I think if, remember, if we say 5% of patients have pancreatic cysts and every single patient needs a, a 10-year follow-up minimum, no other patient would get scanned. Every scanner would be filled with cyst patients. And again, the cyst size thing they spoke about is challenging because if cysts grow a little bit, then they change categories. And they made that point as well, that you would have to continuously be careful to change categories for these cystic lesions. Once patients developed worrisome criteria, of course, then things changed. But the majority of patients, as we mentioned, typically stay about the same or have very minimum growth. 